I am grateful to U.S. India Political Action Committee, FIID, and American Foreign Policy Council for organizing this event and giving me an opportunity to interact. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, before I start, I've got two small questions to pose. Can you hear me now? I, I think I was talking without a, this thing here. That pertains to the subject which I have been asked to speak on. Moderate and balanced Afghanistan, imperative for regional security. Is there anyone in this room who subscribed to the idea that a violent, turbulent, extremist, unstable Afghanistan is good for the region? I think no one accepts. So I think we have got consensus on that as far as the subject is concerned. But there is another question. Does any one of you feel that while it may be good for the region, but probably it has got no implications for the rest of the world? That is, Afghanistan poses a turmoil, and Afghanistan in turmoil, Afghanistan that is violent, Afghanistan that is supporting extremism. It constitutes only a threat to the region and not to the countries beyond the region. Not the United States, not the West, not the rest of the world. You don't subscribe to that view. So I think the subject is not actually whether moderate and balanced Afghanistan is required or not. It is required. And let me tell you, it is not only required for the region, it is required for the entire world. Then what are we really talking about? What is this subject about? The problem is this, what we really are talking about is that we all have a certain wish, a certain assessment. And we think that things will happen or won't they happen that way. There's a question mark. There are optimists and then there are pessimists. Well, I'm an optimist, not because they are always right, but because they keep the hopes alive till they are proved wrong. There is good enough a time to live. What are, why is there a gap between the optimists, the pessimists, and the people who are doubting? It is basically because there is a sharp variance in critical assumptions on which we are working. I wish that there is a stable Pakistan. It's a moderate Pakistan. And all those who wish and anticipate and are planning and working on that, like our, my, our chairman for the session, Mr. Jav Smith, consciously or subconsciously, they're working on four assumptions. Their first assumption is that Afghanistan, which ushered into a democratic process, following the Loya Zirga, was able to have a, a constitution and then an elected president. Probably there will be an automatic transition to this democratic process. It has stabilized itself. And there will be transition of power in which different ethnicities, different groups, whatever their other beliefs may be, will fall in line. And there will be the transference power, there will be elections, which will be peaceful. And it will be in 2014. This is one assumption. If this assumption is not true, then we are talking the opposite of it, is something which is quite a different one, which is a civil war situation, a bloodshed, and then eventually, in whose hand the reign of power will come, in that thing of violence, is unpredictable. So that is the first assumption. The second is that Taliban will change. It is assumed that the people who have worked on certain script for a long time, they will give it up. 
the path of violence, the extremism, the faith in jihadi uh, ideology. And then come, either join the political process or will try to become an influential ideological group which will influence the political life of Afghanistan, even if they do not directly participate in the election. That is the second opposition. Now, how will it come? There can be a distance. Some people think, well, we can talk it out to them. Something we can ideologically do. Some other thing we can buy them out. Everybody has been trying in their own way. The Pakistan has been trying. The United States have been trying. Even the British have been trying to do it independently and then collectively. I think when a section was even in touch with the Afghan administration, and they were also trying to talk to certain factions. Nobody knows which section is talking to whom and is talking what. But this is an assumption. If this assumption is not true, then we are back in 2001. You know, sorry, correction. We are back in a situation worse than 2001. I'll come to that later. There is a third assumption that 325,000 325, Afghan National Army and the police will deliver. It will hold together. It has been equipped. It has been trained. It has got officers who are sufficiently motivated, and it is felt that irrespective of what happens at the political level in Afghanistan, the strong military and the police will remain a disciplined force upholding the constitution and the democratic values of the Afghan state. This is an assumption. In last 12 months, I have met at least 15 to 20 top Pakistani security officials with the rank of left and general and above in different places and others. Not one of them has subscribed to this view that this army will be able to hold back, irrespective of the fact what is their weapons, what is their training level, what is this thing. They say it is, there is a mismatch between the officers' level and the cadres. And once the ethnic loyalties come up, once the, there is a transition of power, and again these things, this will get probably to create a national army is a time-consuming process. It does not happen overnight. But I don't believe them, as I have never believed many Pakistanis. I don't believe them. <laughs> but this is a question mark. This is a question mark. That if it does not remain what it is. Let me tell you one thing. Najibullah's army was much better trained, was much better this thing, and it could not hold on. But I think a lot of there are positive things. And the United States has done a lot, given a lot of these things. But then I think little short of what should have been done. I think it was brought out by our deputy uh, ambassador, in, uh, the Afghan ambassador in Delhi. That it doesn't have, and I think some others also made the, made the point, the logistics, the air defense, the services and maintenance of the equipment, artillery, air defense powers, all these things, there are big gaps. And those gaps are there not because the Afghan government did not want to fill these gaps. These gaps are there not because the Americans did not want to do it. It is not that the Afghan army did not want to do it. It is because of the Bonn Conference and thereafter. The Pakistanis never wanted an Afghan National Army to be equipped and to develop the muscle that it could give resistance to any of the things or any of the designs that they may have in that area. Their, their wish was accommodated. So that is another. But the another one is that Pakistan will change. There is a, another assumption. That is, Pakistan will take and assume a role of a very responsible state. No duplicity, no double talk, will commit itself to fight against terror, will have, be a very benevolent participant in the Afghan reintegration, reconciliation process, development process, and will do everything possible. And I think all that, the right type of noises which are coming from Pakistan, gives somebody a lot of hope. Friends, I'm not a scientist, but I'm a great admirer of Einstein. For one thing that he defined, insanity is. Insanity, he said, is doing the same thing over and over again and thinking that next time the results will be different. You do the same thing once, and you get a certain uh, thing. You put your hand on the burner, and it burns. Put the second time, it burns. You think third time, maybe the stove has changed its mind. 
and you still do it. That is what he said was insanity. I don't think that he had ever Pakistan in mind or anybody else in mind. But the fact remains, that is unless the Pakistan proves by its conduct. Pakistan walks the way and says, probably there's every reason, the onus of proving it lies on Pakistan. Other countries to modulate their policies, responses, ideas on the basis of the assurances probably could be a good policy with the countries who have no such a grand track record of such a long time of going to the extremes, which is totally unacceptable in any form of international relations. I don't want to go into that. It's not a question of history. But my point is that this is an assumption. may still come true. Now, my grievance is not about whether the assumptions will come true or not. I am no diplomat, I am no intellectual. I am a security man, plain and simple. We make assumptions and we work on that. We hope for the best and try for the worst. If it doesn't come true, we will face it and fight it. That is not the problem. I have got a problem on some other count. That is, you do everything to see that these assumptions don't come true. In all the four of it, let us see what all has been ha happening after the search or before, after the point that we talked about. We first talked about the withdrawal, then took the initiative of search. I do not know. We couldn't understand it. I could not understand. Because if surge is supposed to have a deterrent effect or a punitive effect, if you have already announced that you are going to withdraw in 2014, it won't have that effect. You only have to bide the time. But from that time onwards, whether we are talking now of zero option, now we are talking about um, the new things that is, you know, a lot of new, this thing that uh, security arrangements, I, now I think the zero option has been given up. The security arrangement has been uh, accepted with the chief of staff who was there in Kabul, I think, day for yesterday. Now there is this thing of the resolute support is, to, is the new operation, resolute support that is to follow. Now that it has been accepted that, well, Karzai is going to cooperate and, well, there will be not a zero option, but there will be, now they will be talking by October, they will be finalizing it. That is a lot of things are happening. But are these things happening by which we are trying to make the assumption on the basis of way? We are hoping that the process will succeed. Are we reinforcing them or are we going against them? Now take one by one. We talk about strengthening the democratic process. By undermining Karzai's position and allowing in, in, in uh, Doha, talk to those people who are claiming themselves to be the Emirates, the Emirates of Afghanistan, seriously undermines the democratic credentials of the government that, is, that has come through a legitimate process of electoral, a legitimate electoral process. Let us not talk about personalities. Let us talk about processes. Processes are important. Karzai might have failed. But if the democratic process is undermined, then the transition of power, these are the people whom you have got to fight again through a democratic process. If you delegitimize delegitimize uh, legitimize it. If the very people who installed it, who are instrumental in building it up, probably will be, uh, will be quite, uh, uh, you know, the very purpose will be negated by that. While we had been talking about the assumption that security forces must be strengthened, how much has been the denial about the security forces? If they do not want to go to the Afghanistan, you would, if you were to Pakistan for training, you would like them to go to Pakistan for training. You would like to put artificial restrictions on them that if you go to India, probably the sensitivities of Pakistan would be adversely hurt, and therefore that becomes unacceptable. If they want a certain types of weapons and arms, you think that a vetting by Pakistan is necessary. The very country which is interested in seeing and ensuring that Afghanistan does not stabilize, that's why I asked the first question, is there anyone in this room who thinks that there is a vested interest. There is a class of people which are known as the conflict entrepreneurs. I also belong to that very class. Who have got a vested interest in continuing the conflict. And they, they derive their net advantage from the conflict. There are people within Afghanistan. 
there will be people out of Afghanistan. If they are the very people whose conditions you are meeting at, you are undermining, you are, work, work, you are walking in a way different to the assumptions on which you had been trying to make your strategy work. The strategy was based on certain assumptions. And then about Pakistan, the many things that have happened. And recently we find that there has been a certain amount of the new assurances that have been given. The new sort of a, um, uh, handing them over a certain initiatives, including the talks which were happening, including the tie-ups with the Taliban. Well, many of these things are known. Some of these things are not very confirmed. But we all know that some of the understandings and the things that have been worked out probably do not necessarily make Pakistan in a position where we can really depend on it, uh, on it very, very substantially. So the matter of concern is that the straws in the wind are indicative that we are working in the direction opposing, opposed to the assumption on which the strategy of peace, moderation, stability in Afghanistan is based. If that happens, the post-2014 scenario may not be exactly what we are expecting. In my own opinion, I don't think that it is going to be some catastrophic big war, but it is going to slide millimeter by millimeter into this thing where the Taliban will start strengthening and taking control of the civil society. They've already taken control of the some areas, and in spite of the fact that uh, there was this thing, um, there was a heavy presence of the <coughs> International Assistance Force, in spite of the fact that there was a democratic government which was relatively powerful, we may have a weaker democratic government next time. It is in spite of the fact that there were uh, not that much of an interference from Pakistan as it would normally would have been, there might be a situation where the radicals might be able to strengthen themselves. And gradually, some other proxies of theirs who may assume power, who may get political power, they would be able to float and make them take the power, which may be quite close to a regime or to the people who are able to influence the events from across the border. So the challenge before us is, how do we make these assumptions work? What is that we have got to do from now till 2014 and have a roadmap for the post-2014? where there will be the presence of, uh, the, uh, of the Western troops there. And what is that India can do? What is that the other democracies can do? What is that the other countries of the region can do, including Pakistan? What is that that can be done to see that the Pakistan, which is an important country, you know, Pakistan is an extremely important country in this whole thing. And we have got to carry Pakistan with us. We have got to make it believe that it is in the Pakistan's interest. How is it that we give that assurance to Pakistan? That it is in its larger interest, that it has peace with India, that it has a stability in Afghanistan, that it is able to work in its own best interest by minimizing the conflictual situation. You know, presumption that people always work in their best self-interest is one of the worst presumptions of history. It doesn't happen that way. So ladies and gentlemen, my point is, India has got a big responsibility in a sense. What is there that India can do? What is there that the United States can do to create conditions in Pakistan and in Afghanistan where the assumptions of peace, the assumptions of stability, the assumptions of moderation can hold good and they can come true? And should that happen, I don't think that this is a very difficult thing to, to achieve. It is very much doable. I must say that United, United States has paid a very, very heavy price. And thousands, they have lost the soldiers there. They have paid the huge money cost over there. And let this entire uh, uh, investment in peace, let this entire investment in fight against terror and extremism not go waste. Should that not happen, probably we will be starting from a very, very uh, from the point zero zero, and that point zero zero will be much more difficult this time 
to contain and control and its consequences and repercussions on Pakistan will be very heavy. Now, I will just tell you one small thing before I close, that why in India we are quite concerned about it. You know, barely about two weeks back in Washington, D.C., there was an ambassador's roundtable. And in that, as the media reported it, Ambassador Blackwell was quoted, and I quote, there is no evidence that Pakistan military has changed its view. Its primary role is to prevent the rise of India. It continues to look at Taliban as a strategic asset that can be leveraged to further its strategic objectives vis-a-vis -vis India, unquote. And what is this strategic leverage against? We are, you know, jargon, and we get confused. We say strategic leverage, probably it is some sort of an abstract painting or something that they would like to use. On July 11, Brigadier Siddiqui, for whom General uh, Pravez Musharraf had a great um, respect for his scholarly views and for his seniority and all that, he wrote a very interesting article, and in which he has quoted that in a meeting, and he has quoted General Pravez Musharraf, and he said that Mr. Kayani was the ISI chief at that time which appeared in the news on 11th of July, 11th of this month. And I will just quote these words. And he says, what Blackwell says is the continuity of the intent, continuity of the, of the desire to exercise that leverage. And here is the leverage. And Parvesh Musharraf says, sir, the Taliban are our strategic reserves. We can unleash them in tens of thousands against India any time we want, unquote. Now, this is the leverage. Now, they may look, uh, they may look very far-fetched. They may look that, well, they are not a matter of concern. Probably sitting here in Washington, you may think it is not. But then, if somebody would have said that, well, what happened in, 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 uh, on September 11, that was also too far-fetched when somebody must have thought or talked about it. Things, when they happen, do not look as far-fetched as they look when they do not happen or they have not happened. And the last thing that I would like to say is this, that radicalism or threats like this are not in geographical limits. It, there will be, if there is a threat, it will not only be to, for the region. It will be a threat for all of us, for the entire world. Terrorism is a potent threat, and we have got to take a very, very serious and a very considered view about the things that we do. Thank you.